and uh, Lord willing, you have a notebook and a piece of paper and something to write on, and you can write on, uh, add some notes to it as we go down through here, and want to encourage you to ask questions. Did you get one, Craig? Did you get one? And, uh, and I'm Lord willing, I'm going to try to uh, do something a little different than I've done before, and that was to print up some of my notes, or most I can anyway, and uh, go through them. Revelation chapter 1, and let's get some an introduction to the book of Revelation. Now, of course, the author of the book is the Holy Spirit through John. Now, it says the revelation of St. John the Divine. All right. Uh, the book of Revelation tells you, first of all, how the whole thing ends up. That's one of the things about the book of Revelation. It reveals to a Christian how it ends up. Now, think about that a minute. Isn't it a wonderful thing to know how the thing ends up? Isn't it a thing with peace and happiness and joy to know how the thing's all going to end up? Now, there's four things. He tells you how uh, the earth is going to end up. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 21. And this is how the earth is going to end up. This is going to be the finishing thing of it. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth uh, were passed away, and there was no more sea. All right, the first heaven and the first earth are what? They're passed away, they're gone. Revelation 21, 1. Now, uh, the verse you can add with that verse right there. Alongside uh, the earth passing away, right down Second Peter. And here's another verse showing you how the thing's going to end up. Second Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also with the works that are therein shall be burned up. Then the whole thing, as far as the works of this earth are concerned, are going to go up in a ball of flame. So what attitude ought a Christian to have? Next verse. The attitude a Christian ought to have in relationship to the fact the whole thing's going to end up as far as the earth are concerned, is going to go up in a pile of smoke. The attitude you ought to have is verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, so, Christian, uh, if you build a bunch of junk down here, and it looks like a great big deal, sometimes it does, where is it eventually going to end up? It's going to be burned up. So your attitude ought to be what? What manner of person you ought to be in all, underline that word, what? I'm in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 11. So what attitude ought a Christian ought to have because he knows how it's going to end up? What's the word? Everybody say it. <laughs> Holiness. So it's good to know how the thing's going to end up because it'll help you be what? Help you be a pure Christian. Help you get rid of sin. It'll help you in holiness. So you ought to know how it's going to end up. And all holiness and conversation, that's your life, that's the way you live, and Godliness, looking for and hastening into the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. So you want to have right down Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10, 11, and 12, giving you the right attitude of how it's going to end up. Anybody ever read a novel? You ever read a novel and you're reading through the novel and you're all excited and everything and you get so excited you want to say, I just want to find out how this thing ends. I'm going to flip over to the last page and find out how it ends. 
So you know what we're going to do? We're going to read the book of Revelation and find out how the thing ends. Why? It'll make you live holy. Make you live holy. Now, uh, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. And look at verse 27. And how the whole thing's going to end up. That's what the book of Revelation will do. Yes, go ahead. Uh, all right, that's the sea that is found in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And it says uh, uh, in verse 1, it's, it, And the earth was without form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep. Genesis 1, 2. It said there were no more sea. That's that body of water that the throne of God sits on. And it's called the deep called the deep in uh, throughout the Bible, called the great deep in some places. And God's throne sits on the face, uh, God's throne is on it. And it, uh, it's called the Sea of Glass. We'll talk about it more in Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 6. And this is called the Sea of Glass, Sea of Glass. And it's like that, and it's called in here in Revelation 21, 1, and it said, and there's no more sea. The Lord does away with it. No more sea. He does away with that body of water. That's there. You've heard me talk about it before. All right. And that's uh, found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, 3, 4, and 5. And it's called the firmament in verse 6. And God said, let there be a Firmament it in the midst of the waters. No, the firmament is in the middle of it. The waters is the waters. That's the deep. And it divided the waters from the waters. The firmament is in the middle of the deep. So in the middle of this, there's a place called the firmament. And that firmament is in there. And then that, so that divides it. There's water here. And there's water here. Water in both places. And this is the firmament in between it. In between the waters. Now that goes into a long thing. That's what it is. All right. Uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 27. Revelation 21 and verse 27. And there shall be no wise enter into it anything that defile us, nor whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. There is no more what? There's no more sin. No more sin. Sin's done away with. Sin is gone. There'll become an end to sin. All right, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Tells you how the whole thing's going to end up. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. How's the devil going to end up? Revelation chapter 20, verse 10 says, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So it says the devil's cast into the lake of fire. And it said where the beast, that's the uh, Antichrist, and the false prophet, that's a, a third part to the satanic trinity, and, and the beast was thrown in at the end of the tribulation, and the false prophet was thrown in at the end of the tribulation. Look at your Bible. And it says, And the devil was cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. At the end of the millennium, the devil's going to be thrown into the lake of fire, and the devil's through with. He does no more. He deceives nobody after that. Did you get one of these, brother? All right, uh, question. All right, Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, the end of death. Now, there's a book in the Bible that is, that is designed on beginnings. It's designed on beginnings. What book is it? Genesis. So, the Genesis begin everything. The book of Revelation ends everything. So, it runs in a complete circle. Runs in a circle. All right, where do you read of the tree of life? In Genesis, do you know the tree of life is also in the book of Revelation? Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. 
Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have a right to the tree of life. It runs in a circle. So the, if the revelation tells you how the thing ends up. All right, uh, Revelation 21, 4. 21, 4. It says, uh, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more, what? Then it'll become a time where the Lord says, Okay, from now on, nobody's going to die. That's going to be a wonderful thing, won't it? No more death. All right, now take your Bible and turn to, we've got to uh, turn to Revelation, and in order to get an understanding of the book of Revelation, you know, you have to know how it's divided. So turn to Revelation chapter 1, and here's a major thing you need to get right off the bat. Revelation chapter 1, let's begin at verse 19. And you have to get this, or the book of Revelation will not be clear in your heart and mind and soul. Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. I'll try not to go too fast. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So it has, it has three divisions. Underline it. Write the things which thou hast seen. Hast seen. That's one. And the things which are. That's two. And the things which shall be hereafter, three, that divides the book of Revelation into three parts. Now, in order to get the thing clear, you have to go back to verse 10 and get an understanding of verse 10. All right, it says, And I was, now I'm writing in your Bible, in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now, write this in the margin of your Bible. It was not Sunday. The Lord's day is not Sunday. So, something happened to the Apostle John. What happened to him? Take your Bible and turn to the book of John. Turn to the Gospel of John. And see what happened to John when he said he was in the Spirit. In the Spirit. Turn to the Gospel of John. Chapter 21. And look what Jesus said about the Apostle John who wrote the book of Revelation. Uh, John chapter 21. And uh, let's pick up verse uh, 22. Revelation 21, 22. Jesus said unto him, let's go back and pick up verse 20. Then Peter turned about, seeing a disciple whom Jesus loved. That's the apostle John, following, which also leaned upon his breast at the supper. So that's John. John's the one that had his head right up there on his chest uh, at the last supper. And said, Lord, what is he that betrayeth thee? That's what that's what John asked back there at the Last Supper. Now verse 21. Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? He's pointing to John. And Peter's talking to him, say, what, what about John? What's John going to do? Now verse 22. And Jesus said unto him, he says to Peter, If I will that he tarry till I come, now get this, because this is important. Tarry till I come. What is that to thee? Follow thou me. All right. So he says, uh, he's going to tarry till I come. Now, verse 23. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that this disciple should not die. They said, well, John's going to live forever. He's not going to die. Said Terry, till Jesus comes, John's not going to die. He's going to live forever. That this disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said, now he's going to straighten them out. Now the Holy Spirit's going to straighten them out. Yet Jesus said, not unto him, 
he shall not die. Jesus didn't say he wasn't going to die. What did Jesus say? But if I will, did he tarry till I come? What is that to thee? So Peter was standing there and he saw John walk up. And Peter looks at Jesus and says, well, okay, uh, well, Jesus, you know what's going to happen in the future. You just told me how I was going to die. And I want to ask you, how, what about John? Is John how, what's going to happen to John? How's he going to die? And then Peter says, uh, he'll tarry till I come. And then the thing went around. Everybody got it, went around, and they got the thing going, you know, by, uh, by the old grapevine that, uh, oh, come on, folks. <laughs> everybody talks. And they said, well, Jesus said that he wasn't going to die. And then the Holy Spirit explains it in verse 23. He didn't say G that John wasn't going to die. He said John was going to tarry till he come. So the apostle John did, did die. <laughs> What happened is he got carried forward all the way up to the second coming of Christ and he saw Jesus Christ come and he saw the whole book of Revelation take place and he saw the return of Jesus Christ. He saw it because the Lord revealed it to him. He said, tarry till I come. He's going to be transported into time. He's going to see the second coming of Christ. He was transported into it. That's why when John writes, he's writing just like he sees the whole thing taking place. So John writes a book of Revelation as though he's seeing it and he's right there and he sees the whole thing takes place right in front of his eyes. So he sees something and he's like, oh yeah, oh ouch. Oh, I can't write that, can I, Lord? No, you can't write that. So some things he doesn't let him write. But he does let him write a lot of what takes place in the tribulation. So he's forward in time. Now back to Revelation. So the Apostle John is forward in time. He's not writing back here like you and I and everything being 2,000 years in the future. Tribulation hadn't happened yet. Come on, folks. But John writes like, boy, it's happening right now because he sees it take place. Now, back to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, look at verse 19 again. So when John writes, He's looking at the tribulation taking place. All right, Revelation chapter 1, verse 19 says, Write these things which thou hast seen. The things he saw, what was it? So draw a line from verse 19 back to verse 11. The things that he saw, what he saw, he saw verse 11. Verse 11 says, uh, Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Write uh, what thou seest, write in a book, and send it into the seven churches, which are in Asia, Ephesus, and to Samaria, and to Pergamos, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, to Philip, and to Laodicea. So what did John saw? What did he see? What have thou hast seen? He saw the seven churches. So the seven churches are chapters what? One, two, and three. Write it down. The things thou hast saw. The things thou hast saw are what? The seven churches, and that's chapters 1, 2, and 3. So the book of Revelation is divided into chapters chapters 1, chapters 2, and chapters 3. That's the first division. The first division is chapters 1, 2, and 3. That's the seven churches. That's the seven churches. All right, then the next division, he says, the things that thou what? The things that are. So John's been transported into time. So he's looking down at the tribulation. So chapters 4 through chapters 19 are the great tribulation, and that's the second division. Then he says, the things that what? And the things that shall be. So that's chapters 20. Through chapters 22. So it has three divisions. Chapters 1, 2, and 3. Past. Chapters 4 through 19. Present. Chapters 20 through 22. Future. Now, it says in Revelation chapter 4, heaven opens. It opens one time. Heaven opens again. Second time. Happens two times. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Heaven opens. And it opens again, Revelation chapter 19. So that makes a division here and here. 
Now, the great problem you get into is chapter one. Now, any questions? Any questions? Now it's time to ask a question because I'm fixing on going into another thing. Okay, the problem you get into now is this. I'm going to erase this, but you want to get to division. Chapters 1, 2, and 3, past. Chapters 4 through 19, present, the things you see. Chapters 20 through 24, you need to get that down. Has everybody got it? I think I got a piece of paper. Okay, now the problem you get into is this. Chapters 1, 2, and 3, all your commentaries, 90% of them. I found two commentaries after looking at all the commentaries in my office, anywhere from 25 to 30 of them. Two commentaries say that chapters 1, 2, and 3 are aimed at the church age, all except for two. Every commentary that I read said that the chapters 1, 2, and 3 were aimed at the church age. That's disastrous. But every one of them commentaries said it. Two commentaries didn't. Dr. Rutland's and uh, ah, no, he is the Companion Bible by Bullinger. The Companion Bible by Bullinger, and those two said that it was aimed. Chapters one, two, and three are aimed at the tribulation. I agree totally that chapters 1, 2, and 3 are aimed at the seven churches in the tribulation. Now, to prove my point, you need to look down in your, in your notes there, down to overcome. Overcome. You need to have an outline of the first three chapters of the seven churches, and it says about the seven churches, all seven churches must overcome. Now, you can spiritualize it to a Christian. Let's do that first of all. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Timothy. Now, 2 Timothy. Now, we're going to spiritualize the first three chapters. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy 3, 16. Going to spiritualize it. Second uh, Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration unto God, of God, and is profitable, now underline this next word, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Circle the word, for, 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 for. All the Bible is for a Christian. But not all the Bible is to a Christian. Now write it down that way. All the Bible is for a Christian. But not all the Bible is to a Christian. Some of the Bible is not to you. Some of it is to the tribulation saint. Some of it is to the millennial saint. But it's all for you and I benefits. All for us. It's not all to us. Now, it's a great deal of difference. Okay, now, for the help of a Christian, I'm going to spiritualize uh, chapters 1, 2, and 3. Now, turn to 1 John. Turn to 1 John. And look at 1 John chapter... Uh, look at, I'm looking for the word overcome in 1 John. I thought I had it. But I have didn't write the verse in my notes. Chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, yes, uh, First John chapter 4, verse 4. Ye of God, little children. Ye of God, little children. Now watch it. And have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Then if you have Jesus Christ, what have you already done? You've already overcome. So what, is, what disaster will you get into? 
you read the word overcome as it occurs in the book of Revelation and say, see, well, that's what saved people. That's all saved people and we're already overcome. So we don't have to worry about overcoming because so it's not us. We, we, that's automatic for us because we're already saved. That's a spiritual application of the word overcome. Now, Revelation chapter 1, and let's get the occurrence of the word overcome. All right, first of all, turn to Revelation chapter 2 and look at verse 7. This is the church of Ephesus. This is the first church. Look at verse 1, under the angel of the church of Ephesus. Now skip down and get verse 7. Verse 7 says, He that hath an ear, let him hear with the Spirit said unto the churches, to him that overcometh. Will I give to eat of what? The tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. All right? Give to eat of what? The tree of life. Now, a Christian never eats of the tree of life. You will not eat of the tree of life. Why? Because you already have eternal life, and you don't have to eat of the tree of life. But a man in a tri in a man of the tribulation has to overcome the mark of the beast in order to eat of the tree of life over here. Turn to Revelation chapter 22. You should have the cross reference in your Bible. Revelation 22, 4. So the overcoming of the church of Ephesus is aimed at a tribulation saint overcoming the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 22. Then he has a right to the tree of life. Revelation 22, 14. And it says, Blessed are they that what? Do what? That's what messed everybody's mind up. When they read that, they said, oh no, the Bible can't mean what it says. We've got to go to a new translation. So they all grab out of their uh, Greek concordance and run to a new modern Bible and just do something wrong with their brain. Their brain goes something wrong with their brain. It go cut, and God just makes their brain go wrong. Because you mess with the book. You mess with the book. God messes with your mind. It's absolute. So all you have to do is mess with the book. And that's what good men, saved men, have done. Now what does it say? Verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments. That's in the tribulation. That they may have a right to the tree of life. They have to overcome and they have to do what? They have to keep commandments. Do you know how to spiritualize it and get away with it? You know what I do? You know what they do to spiritualize it? Write this down. When a fellow doesn't believe what he reads and he spiritualizes it, you know what he's going to do next? Write it down in your notes. He's going to say these two commandments here are the two commandments that Jesus gave way back here. Jesus gave two commandments that wasn't the Ten Commandments of the Father. Jesus gave two. Come on, folks. They'll say, okay, keeping his commandments over here are the two they give over here. I can keep both this. One of them to believe on him and love your neighbors yourself. I can do both those. You've already believed in Jesus, haven't you? You kept one of them. Love your neighbors yourself. Ooh, boy. But I still love, I love it. It really ain't hard. But they ain't the two. He told them about the ten. It's the ten he's keeping. Okay. Now, let's go. Revelation chapter 11. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. Here's the next church. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 11 is the uh, church of Smyrna, verse 8. Under the angel of the church of Smyrna. Mark it, verse 8. All right, verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear with the Spirit, said unto the churches, He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the what? Second death. Now, wait a minute. Here's a Christian back here. When a Christian gets raptured out and goes, he's not going to even have to think about second death. He's got eternal life. He's not going to have to worry about no second death. Second death ain't going to happen to you one way or the other. Second death don't even apply to you. All right, now, for application of the second death, take your Bible and turn to Revelation. Let's see what the second death is. Turn to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And uh, let's pick up uh, Revelation chapter 20. Let's go back and pick up. Uh, uh, let's pick up that uh, second dish. 
is uh, found in chapter 20, verse 4. No, five, and the rest of the dead live not again till the thousand years are furnished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. There it is, verse 6. Revelation 26. Revelation 26. Now watch it. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death hath no power, but he shall be a uh, priest of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Going to reign with Jesus Christ a thousand years. The second death won't affect him. Now, what is the second death? Look at uh, 21 8. 21 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and all, uh, idolaters and all liars shall have the part in the lake of fire. The, the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Now watch it. Look at the last five words. Which is the what? Second death. Then the second death is what, folks? It's going to hell. It's going to hell. Now, now, Revelation chapter uh, 21. I mean, Revelation chapter uh, 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was what? Cast into what? The lake of fire. Now read the verse in front of it. Death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the what? Second death. So the second death is over here to great white throne judgment. The second death has to do with the man what? Overcoming. Overcoming. So if he overcomes, his name is in the book of life. So when he gets to the great white throne judgment, no, wait a minute, judgment seat of Christ is taking place up in heaven during the tribulation. Write it in your notes. The judgment seat of Christ is taking place in heaven during the book of Revelation. Write it down. The judgment seat of Christ is taking place in heaven. During the book of Revelation, as the book of Revelation takes place, judgment seat of Christ is going up in heaven. To the tribulation saint, he's not judge the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, regardless whether it's seven years or three and a half years, it's immaterial. Because I believe it's seven years. But uh, it goes on that period of time, judgment seat of Christ is going on about there. Somebody said, how in the world can you judge all the Christians at judgment seat of Christ in seven years? Well, just like the Lord can hear every saint pray. Does he hear them all pray at the same time? Well, if the Lord took the thing, had the thing take place all at the same time, if he does, wouldn't be nothing to him. He could deal with you as an individual. On an individual basis, at the same time dealing with somebody else. Well, if he takes, you, if he takes them all through one at a time, boy, there's going to be a long line. I don't want to be at the end of the line. <laughs> But uh, that does make good preaching. I think it, uh, it's going to take place all at once. That's what I think. I think it's just going to take just, just he hears your prayer and your prayer and your prayer and your prayer all at once. I think it's just going to take place pretty quick. Now, uh, write this down. The book of life is opened up to see if the millennial saint's in it and the tribulation saint in it. That's why the book of life is there. That's why the book of life is there, because it has a man's name in it. Tribulation saints, name's not written in the book, he goes to hell. If his name is written in the book, he goes to heaven. But it has to do with overcoming. Overcoming. Now again, uh, look at the third church. Chapter 2, verse 17. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. Revelation chapter 2. And pick up verse 17. This, this is to show you the division of the book of Revelation that the first three chapters are not the church age. Revelation 2, verse 17. And this is the church of Pergamos, verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos. Now verse 17. 
He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. To him that overcometh, there it is, said to all seven churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save uh, he that receiveth it. All right, now underline in the verse, to him that overcometh will I give to, to give to eat of the hidden manna. Now I'm going to spiritualize it first of all, put it back in the church age. I'm going to spiritualize the verse, put it back in the church age. And so I come up with this book called Morning Manna. The morning manna is what? The morning manna is a, and the only way to get, get it, the morning manna is, uh, is bread. The manna is bread. Bread from heaven. It's called the angel's bread. Come and give them bread from heaven. Turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. The Gospel of John, chapter 6. This is what I'm spiritualizing it now. I'm applying it to a, a saint. Uh, the Gospel of John chapter 6, and uh, look at, uh, where is that? He talks about that manna, and he calls it bread. Uh, uh, 32, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father gave you the true bread from heaven. Okay? So he's calling that manna. He calls a manna what? He calls a manna bread. You say, what is the bread? Turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. And in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So bread is what, folks? It's spiritualizing it. It's the word of God. So what do you do with the hidden manna? We say the hidden manna is uh, passages of Scripture. God's hid in his book. And we need to get up early in the morning and go find those hidden verses of Scripture, and that's the hidden manna. Now, that, that, that's just a spiritual application. That's not so, doctrinally. You ought to get up in the morning, amen, and read your Bible and get God's hidden manna. That's the spiritual application. The hidden manna doesn't go that way. Now, take your Bible and see the hidden manna. Now, turn to the book of Revelation and turn to Revelation chapter 12. And in Revelation chapter 12, let's get the hidden manna. Revelation chapter 12. And let's pick up verse 6. Revelation 12, 6. And it says, Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. And it says, Revelation 12, 6. And the woman, right in the margin of your Bible, the woman is Israel. We'll get into that later. And the woman fled into the wilderness. And we'll get into that later. Which she had a place prepared of God. And they shall, underline it, feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Underline the word, feed her. The her is the nation of Israel. And underline the word feed, feed. Now take your Bible and turn to the book of Jeremiah and turn to Jeremiah chapter 50. Now you need to write all the cross references down. Turn to them. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 50. And this is probably not in your notes, so you probably ought to write it down. It's probably not in your notes. Jeremiah chapter 50. Verse 19, Jeremiah 50, 19. All right, let's begin. Verse 19. I want you to get to the verse and mark the verse. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 19. And I will bring Israel again to her habitation. Bring, bring him again. That, that's, they're already there. He brought them back again. And he shall, now underline it, feed, that matches Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, feed on Carmel, Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel's up there by the sea. That's where Elijah uh, had the thing with the prophets of Baal up on Mount Carmel. And Bashan, and his soul shall be satisfied upon Mount Ephraim. There's another place. And Gilead, there's another place. 
Now, verse 21. In those days, and in that time, he's emphasizing it. Said it twice. Those days, and that time. Saith the Lord. Now watch it real careful. The iniquity of Israel shall be sought for. And there shall be none. And the sins of Judah. And they shall not be found. That's the second advent. That's when Jesus Christ comes back at the second advent. You look for the what? The sins, the iniquities of the nation of Israel and the sins of Judah. And they won't be found. That right down the cross reference. Daniel chapter 9. Because that's when the Lord forgives the nation of Israel and they become his people again. So you can understand Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 19 and 20. You need to write Daniel chapter 9 down. And Daniel chapter 9, uh, talking about the nation of Israel and their sins being forgiven from verse 24, 25, 26, and 27. And that's talking about the great tribulation. That's Daniel 70th week. And that's when the Lord forgives him and cleanses the nation of Israel. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, 25, 26, and 27. All right. Now take your Bible and turn to Micah chapter 7. Micah. Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7. Verse 14, this verse is also not in your notes. Micah chapter 7, verse 14. Micah chapter 7, verse 14, and it says, Feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thy inheritance, underline the word feed, there in verse 14, which dwell solitary in the woods in the midst of Come out. You just read the identical passage in Jeremiah. I'm in Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7, verse 14. Micah chapter 7, verse 14. This is God feeding the nation of Israel during the tribulation with manna. All right. Uh, let, uh, uh, let them feed in Bashan and Gilead. Now, underline the next part. Now, watch what it says. As. What's the word as mean? Give me a like something. As. So circle the word in your Bible. I'm in verse 14 now. Y'all better say amen. As in the days of old. When was the days of old? The days of old was way back there when they was coming up out of Egypt when they went into the wilderness for 40 years. And he fed them with manna for 40 years in the wilderness. As in the days of old, according to the days of thy coming up out of the land of Egypt. So underline it. He's going to feed them. You underline that word there in verse 14. Feed thy people. How is he going to feed them? Verse 15. According to days of thy coming up out of the land of Egypt. Well, I show unto those most marvelous things. So God's going to feed the nation of Israel with manna. So it's hidden manna. That's exactly what it is. It's hidden manna. Now, take your Bible and turn to the book of Hosea. Hosea and turn to Hosea chapter 2. This verse is also not in my notes. Uh, Hosea chapter 2. Hosea chapter 2. And pick up verse 14. So what God's going to do is he's going to repeat what he did back here in, in Egypt when the children of Israel come up out of Egypt and all the plagues that Pharaoh did on the children of Israel down here and on Pharaoh, all the plagues he did there, he's going to do the plagues again over here. So when he led them out and fed them with manna, he's going to lead them out into the wilderness and he's going to feed them with manna again. It's going to repeat itself. All right. A book of Hosea, chapter 2, verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will array her and bring her unto the wilderness and line her, her, that's Israel, 
uh, into the wilderness, speaking comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards for a sense, and the valley of Achar for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth. Underline it. As in the days of her youth. That's way back there in Exodus chapter 12, 13, and 14. As the days in, as in the days when she come up out of the land of Egypt. There it is again, back there. So he's pointing back there to show you what's going to take place in the tribulation of prayer. And it shall be in that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Isla, and shall call me no more Belial. Uh, verse 18, In that day will I make a covenant with them, with the beast of the field, and so on down through the passage. And it's talking about the nation of Israel and his brethren, talking about the second coming of Christ. All right, write down 18. In that day will I make a covenant. A covenant. That's a new covenant he makes with the nation of Israel. So the key verse. The manna that's given way back there. Now take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 6. And I'll explain this verse, which a lot of people couldn't understand. They read the thing and make the uh, thing don't really make sense unless you put it in the right place. Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, and verse 11, Matthew 6, 11. And what is the prayer? Matthew 6, 11. Give us this day our what? Now, write it down. That's a prayer of the tribulation saint who prays, give us this day our daily bread. Why, our brothers are starved death that they don't get it because there's no rain for three and a half years. People are eating people. And there's no rain for three and a half years. Why, in the tribulation, you know what they have to be? They have to be fed. So the Lord going to feed them. All right, now let's finish it up. Revelation chapter uh, 3, verse 5. Revelation 3, 5. So all seven churches are told to overcome. So the seven churches are in the great tribulation. We'll make spiritual application for a saint's benefit. For your benefit, we'll do that. <laughs> Chapter 3, verse 1, And to the angels of the church of Sodom. Okay, that's 3, 5. Now let's read verse 5. He that overcometh, there it is, underline it. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white remnant, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Now, if you're a Pentecostal, what would you teach? Well, you can lose your salvation if you don't live it. Amen. That's what a Pentecostal would teach you. You can lose your salvation because you don't live it. Your name will be rot, uh, 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 blotted out of the book of life. There's been some Pentecostals get all shook up and say, Oh, man, I think I lost it. God must have blotted my name out of the book of life because I haven't overcome. I was in a terrible sin. And I just give up and quit. Oh, I quit. The verse wasn't to you. See, the verse wasn't to you. You don't have to overcome. Well, you better overcome to bear some fruit. You better overcome to be a blessing. But to overcome to get your name blotted out of the book of life, it ain't aimed at you. Who's it aimed at? It's aimed at a man in the tribulation. Now, look what it says. You just read it. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15 says what? And whosoever is not found written in the book of life. All right. Revelation chapter 20. Now, let's get the, ju the white throne judgment again. Turn to uh, Revelation chapter... Uh, I want another account, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Revelation chapter 14. I say Revelation 14. I want another account. Revelation chapter... Revelation chapter uh, 11. Revelation chapter 11. 
and look at verse 7, Revelation 11, 7. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. I mean, verse 17. I'll get a minute. Revelation 11, 17. All right. Uh, verse 17 says, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and which are to come, because thou hast, ta uh, hast uh, taken of thee thy great power and hast reigned. Now, unblind. And done what? At the end of verse 17. Hast reigned. So where you at? If he has reigned, where are you? Into the millennium. Into the millennium. Now watch the great white throne judgment. Verse 18. And the nations were angry. And the rise come. And the time of the dead. That's Revelation chapter 20. Verse 11. And the time of the dead. That they should be judged. That's the great white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20. You say, what's it doing way back here in chapter 11? Well, I'll explain that later. Uh, now, but watch it. That they should be judged. And that they should give rewards. Underline it. Unto thy servants. Tribulation servants and millennial servants. They get rewarded the white throne judgment. So it's not just for unsaved people. Reward unto thy servants the prophets. Now watch it. And to the saints. Tribulation saints and millennium saints. The judgment seat of Christ has already taken place. And them that fear thy name. That was the qualifications for the tribulation. Small and great. And shall destroy them which destroyed theirs. And so on. That's the great white throne judgment. So write it down. So that's the saints being judged at the white throne judgment. That's why if they don't overcome the mark of the beast, their name is taken out of the Lamb's book of life. It's taken out. You know how they get around it? This is how they get around it. They say, every man's name's written in the Lamb's book of life way back here. Every man's name's written in the Lamb's book of life. And therefore you go all the way to the end and if you don't get saved, your name's taken out. That can be so. You know why? Because Jesus said to his disciples, Rejoice, not that you have rule over the evil spirits, but rejoice because your name is what? Written in the book of life. Rejoice that your name is written in the book of life. Well, if everybody's name is in the book of life, brother, why would have Jesus said that? Rejoice because your name is written in the book of life. Because everybody's name is not written in the book of life. All right. Now, let's finish it up. Revelation chapter... Uh, uh, 3, verse 21. Revelation chapter 3. Uh, no, we skipped one. Revelation 3, 12, which you don't have in your notes. You would need to mark this down. There's only six churches in your notes. Your notes, we missed one in the, in the typology or some way or another. <laughs> she said it's my fault. <laughs> but there's, uh, let's go to Revelation 3, 12. Revelation 3, 12 is going to be the next overcome. And it's going to be the church of Philadelphia, verse 7. Philadelphia, verse 7. And verse uh, 12 is the overcome. It's the uh, next to the last church. It'd be the sixth church. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar. He's going to make a pillar. In the temple of my God. He's going to be a pillar in the temple. And he shall go no more out. And will write upon him the name of my God. The name of the city of my God which is New Jerusalem, which come down out of heaven from my God, and I write upon him my new name. So he gets written on him a new name, and he gets the, to be a pillar in the temple, the temple that's on the earth, a pillar. That may be a spiritual pillar. I would say it's a pillar of some uh, spiritual pillar, I would say. Now, one more. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. This is the seventh church, all seven of them. To him that overcometh, will I, I grant to sit with him, sit with me in my throne. Underline that, in my throne. Even as I also overcome, and am sit down with my father in his throne. So the tribulation saint does what? If he overcomes, he gets to reign with Christ. Uh, cross reference, Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, 
verse 4. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of them that were, underline the word, Revelation 24, beheaded, beheaded, for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which hath not worshipped the beast. See, so it's a tribulation saint. Neither his image, nor hath received his mark in their forehead or in their hand. Now watch it, watch it. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So the tribulation saint, if he overcomes, gets his head cut off, he gets to reign with Christ a thousand years. Questions? Any questions? So chapters 1, 2, and 3, are they overcoming the mark of the beast? Yes, there are seven churches in the tribulation, and these seven churches represent all the tribulation saints. They represent all the tribulation saints. They're not a body, like back here, it's called the church, singular. And it's a body, and all saved people are made up of that church, and they're of one body. It's not a body here. It's not a body here. It's a body over here in the church age. It's a local congregation, but it represents all the tribulation saints. And they still have an individual thing. That's why it says, he that overcometh, individual. He that overcometh, individual. Only in the historical account of it. Historically, yes. But only in the historical account. Because it said in Revelation chapter 1, it says that the churches of Asia. So historically, he sent the out to those local churches in that area, but that's not the doctrinal application. No. No, they, they won't. I doubt if they'll go by Laodicea in Philadelphia. You'd pick out the good one. You sure wouldn't say, I'm Laodicea, would you? <laughs> or, or some of them, or some of them pretty rough. Some of them had some pretty bad things he said about them. Only one church that was good in the whole bunch, and that was, uh, the Church of Philadelphia. That's the only church that was a good one. They get saved. Trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ. And enduring to the end. And keeping his commandments. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Now the book of Hebrews is written to the Hebrews. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3. And watch very how absolutely clear it is. Hebrews 3.14. Hebrews 3.14. I won't change nothing. I'll just read you the verse. Hebrews 3.14. Won't change it. Don't change a word. <laughs> I never do change a word. <laughs> For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. See that, brother? What do you do with it? You don't do nothing with it. You put it right there, and as plain as clear as the nose on your face. You're made a partaker of Christ. If you endure to the end of tribulation, you take the mark of the beast, you go to hell. See that? Or oh, the Pentecostal says, well, you're, if you live it and you work your way and you don't you fall away, you'll be saved. That's not what it says. It says you're made a partaker of Christ. Well, that's what it did say. Somebody, well, a fundamentalist does it like this. A fundamentalist says, you are made partakers of Christ. Oh, the word partaker, oh, that really doesn't mean you receive Jesus Christ. They do, they change the word partaker. Are you a partaker of Jesus Christ? What is a partaker? Yeah, but it said a partaker. They change the word partaker. That's exactly what to do with it. Same one that's found in Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, it says a partaker of the Holy Ghost. They can't stand it, so they change the word partaker. No, they believe you can lose it. <laughs> and they believe you can get it back again. They eat Jesus. Not too much. I couldn't fall that way. I don't know how you're going to make that and go. <laughs> they eat him. Absolutely. 
it's written it's written to the book of Hebrews is to the Hebrews and those are the Jews and it's written basically to the Jews so Hebrews is a aimed right at the tribulation Jew James is written to the 12 tribes James chapter 1 to the 12 tribes is Jewish so Hebrews everything from Hebrews on is aimed at the tribulation saint Everything in the Bible from the book of Hebrews on is aimed at the tribulation saint. Now you can find an awful lot of good things in First John. Oh yes. But you know something? The blood of Jesus Christ. Here's the blood. But am I saved by the blood too? Yes, I'm saved by the blood. But so is he. But he just has to do something more than I have to do. Look at here. No, we're saved by faith. But he had to do something I didn't have to do. I absolutely have built an ark. See? Abraham was saved by faith, but he didn't put his faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He had to believe that his seed would be as the stars of heaven in the sand of the seas. That's what God told him. He said, your, your seed would be as the stars of heaven. So he saved by faith. God did. God told me my seed would be as the stars of heaven and would make a dim. I still go to hell. I have to believe Jesus Christ died for my sins. So we so saved by faith, but uh, things change, brother. So in the tribulation, things change. You know why things change? Because the Lord just said, I made it free, I made it free, I made it free, I made it free, and all these folks are trying to work for it. Okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll let you work for it. And then they're all going to turn around and say, It's free! And still go to hell. It's free now. Free for the asking. But you would sure better ask. And that's what's wrong with the Baptist. Baptists call me a heretic for that. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what they call me for. But, brethren, I'm willing to pay the cost for this here book. And they call the Christians heretics way back there. And the Apostle Paul was called a heretic. Don't bother me, man. I'm willing to pay the cost. I believe it's a holy book. All right. Any other questions? All right, let's close. So that's there, and we'll go from 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 there. I still haven't got to the rest of the chapters four through nineteen. I just gave you one through three as an introduction. You still got to get four through nineteen, and that's where it really become clear. I've had somebody say, Chuck said to me, he said the Book of Revelation wasn't clear until I understood that it was four accounts of the Great Tribulation. And that's what you got to get next Wednesday night. Prayer request. Thanks for coming out on a miserable night. <laughs>